What if the clones were force sensitive? That's our story for today. Hope you guys enjoy this one and let's get right into it. Our story begins on Kamino, as Django Fett is meeting with Count Dooku. Django has provided his blood in order for it to be used as the DNA genome for the upcoming cloning project, a grand army for the Republic. But as Django hands the open vial of blood to Dooku, a bounty hunter that has been tracking Django for months lands on the rainy bridge, immediately firing at Django. Django dodges, then two knives are thrown at him, to which Django deflects them away. But one of them grazed Dooku's cheek, and a single drop of blood fell into the Django Fett blood vial. Dooku didn't notice this, but he had enough of this bounty hunter fight. He grabbed the Rodian hunter, choking and killing him before dropping him into the rainy water. Then telling Django there can be no more loose ends. And so the cloning production would begin, with just a bit of DNA from the very powerful Dooku mixed in with Django's DNA. This would go completely unnoticed for years, and soon enough the Clone Wars would officially begin right on schedule. The Force resided deep inside of the clone troopers, and once unlocked it could be powerful, but none of the clones initially knew that they had it. They would see the Jedi wield the Force, and often wondered what it would be like to have it, but none of them suspected that they did. Until Felucia. A couple months into the war, a battle for the lush jungle planet of Felucia was well underway as a group of five Jedi Knights were leading a clone battalion into battle versus the Separatists. This clone battalion was the first one ever created, and therefore contained the first clones ever created. With Dooku's DNA, it created Force-sensitive clones, but the Force sensitivity was strongest in the first clone, and it decreased ever so slightly with every clone thereafter. So this battalion, the first clone battalion, harbored all of the strongest clones in the Force. The leader of this battalion was called Nas, and his two second-in-commands were Gus and Ant. These were among some of the first clones to choose their own names, and they were out in the battlefield with the five Jedi, none of them Jedi Masters, when suddenly, a Separatist reinforcement shuttle arrived, but it carried only one droid. General Grievous himself was here on Felucia. The five Jedi would quickly run in on Grievous, while the clone troopers watched while engaging with the battle droids, and it was quickly a massacre for the Jedi. Grievous moved in with a horrific laugh, spinning all four of his lightsabers, slamming them down on the Jedi. The first Jedi, a young female Twi'lek, was crushed under the weight of Grievous's swing, dying quickly. Grievous has swung four sabers with immense speed, quickly cutting down three more, and kicking the final one into a rock wall. The clones turned, firing at Grievous, but the droid general crawled at them now, then swung to kill clone commander Nas. But as Nas put his hands up in defense, something happened. Grievous was hit with a sudden force push that sent him sprawling into the trees. Nas's hands were shaking. He didn't try to do this, it just came to him as he tried to avoid the swing. But he looked to Gus and Ant, then ran up to him, and it was like an awakening just occurred in the clones. Nas reached out to the dead Jedi, and a green lightsaber flew into his hand. Gus and Ant tried the same, and instantly, it worked. It was like they were bred to understand how to wield the Force, and it just had to be unlocked. They didn't require much training, it was just in their blood. The lone surviving Jedi, a human male, couldn't believe what he was seeing but he used his surviving breath to tell the clones to trust in the Force. The clone nodded and moved in on Grievous, who was stumbling back to his feet now. He looked to the three clones wielding sabers, tilting his head in confusion. He would just have to slaughter them as well. And as a huge battle was going on behind them, Grievous leapt at the three clones, and the Force inside of the clones guided their movements. The cloning process enhanced their Force abilities as they deflected Grievous' blasts, his strikes, and they moved through the plant life in a sudden duel. As Grievous swung at them, he had to figure that these were just Jedi in disguise. There was no better explanation as to how they were surviving, but he would not lose. He suddenly cut the saber from Nas's hands, then lifted all four sabers for the kill, but Nas then pulled a blaster from his belt, shooting Grievous in the chest. Grievous gasped with surprise, then Gus and Ants attacked again, as Nas began pulling rocks from behind Grievous, hitting him again and again until Ant perfectly spun, stabbing Grievous through the chest. The droid general was dead. The clones unlocked something inside of themselves. This battle would end up being a decisive victory for the Republic, and the three clones would hide this discovery until they were sent back to Coruscant to wait for their next mission. 
but while on Coruscant, Naz, Ant, and Gus snuck away to the Jedi Temple, telling the Temple Guards they have urgent news and must speak to the Council immediately. The Temple Guards allowed the clones inside, then guided them into the Council Chambers, where the Jedi Council was already having a meeting to discuss the war. As the three clones entered, Yoda could sense something in these clones, and they quickly described what happened on Felucia, and how they were able to kill Grievous. The Jedi were clearly skeptical, asking the clones if they were sure, and Naz reached out a hand, pulling Windu's saber into his hand, igniting it, and saying he is absolutely sure about this. Windu put a hand to his chin, calling his saber back, and told the clones they will be sent back to Kamino for extensive testing. This was a new revelation, and they must find out how exactly this has happened. The three clones would accept this, as they were honestly quite scared about their newfound abilities, and as they left to be sent back to Kamino, the Council began new, extremely important discussions. What if it is not just these clones? What if the entire clone army is secretly Force-sensitive? And Obi-Wan recalled his first time on Kamino, when the Kaminoans said that sifo created this army. Obi-Wan wondered aloud if perhaps sifo used some of his own blood to create the army. Plo Koon spoke up, saying that the clones have proven themselves as both good soldiers and good men, but the Force can be dangerous, especially to those who don't fully understand it. And Shakti said that she will begin mandatory testing on all of the clones. Kiedi Mundi said this could be used to end the war almost immediately. They should divert some funds to Electro Staffs for all four sensitive clones. If the rest are like the three clones on Felucia, then they are already strong in the Force. It just has to be mentally unlocked. If they wield Electro Staffs capable of deflecting blaster shots and lightsabers, the clone army will be unstoppable. Peace can return to the galaxy. A vote would be taken on this idea, and ultimately it would be decided that immense production for these Electro Staffs would begin. If the clones are capable of using the Force, then the Republic must use this to win the war. And on Kamino, Naz, Gus, and Ant would begin testing, but rumors quickly began circulating about how they killed Grievous. Currently, the entire 501st, including Rex, Ahsoka, and Anakin Skywalker were on Kamino, as the 501st were getting a rest before their next battle assignment. The clones quickly learned that they may have the Force, and they began trying to use it with no luck, not really understanding it. For it to be unlocked in the first three clones, it took immense fear and desperation, with Grievous closing in on them. But in between tests with the 501st, Clone Captain Gus would come to Rex, Jesse, and a large group of the 501st, and tell them how to use the Force. Gus was born with an understanding of it, and he taught these clones to be mindful, to reach out, to trust in the Force, to let go. And soon, all of the 501st on Kamino would learn that they too have the Force. It was chaos, as they would set up training systems at the highest difficulty, and begin fighting off the training droids without blasters. Among other groups, Rex would run at a group of droids, force pushing a few, crushing two with the close of his fist, kicking another across the room before flipping around to win this training session. The rest of the clones followed Rex's lead, and soon enough, Anakin and Ahsoka were watching this in complete shock. The clones not only had the force, but they were able to quickly grasp how to wield it, for Jedi, it could take years to grasp, but for the clones, it was like they were born to use it. Because they were. And these rumors would begin to spread throughout the galaxy, as more and more clones learned that they could wield the Force. On Ryloth, Jedi Master Imagundi was in a last stand against a huge group of battle droids with Captain Keeley, when suddenly a group of clones from this battalion ran in, slamming into the ground to send the droids away, pulling out Electro Staffs from their belts. The new shipment were arriving across the galaxy. Master Gundi ran into battle with these clones, pushing back the droids as relief aid arrived on Ryloth. The same would happen on many key warring planets like Haternamoidia, Harunkal, Skako Minor, so many other planets as clones not only learned that they could use the force, but were now wielding dangerous electro staffs. It was like millions of Jedi warriors now fought for the Republic, and the tides of war quickly shifted from being even to being completely in the Republic's favor. Even as the Separatists saw this and were putting more and more droids into production, sending thousands, millions more droids out into battle, it just didn't matter. The clones were overpowering them on every single battlefront. On Umbara, as Anakin Skywalker was called back to Coruscant and replaced by General Krell, Rex and his men would quickly sense that something was very wrong with Krell. 
They wouldn't question things at first, following Krell's orders into battle, but upon being ordered into a death march, the clones decided they had enough of this. They had the power to take this into their own hands. So Rex and his men would move in on Krell, and as the Jedi General saw them, he ignited his lightsabers to slaughter them. But Rex caught Krell off guard, reaching his hands out, choking Krell in the air, snapping his neck quickly. Krell fell to the ground, and the clones saw how powerful they truly were. As the Separatists were learning of this, most importantly Dooku and Sidious, they knew they had to act fast. Palpatine approved the production of Electrostaffs for the Grand Army, as denying this request would have been seen as trying to purposely lose the war, but now it was time for the Separatists to retaliate. As they were losing battle after battle across the galaxy, Sidious would order Dooku to launch a large fleet, as large a fleet as possible, to Kamino, destroy the clone DNA, and hopefully with no more clones able to be created, the war can even out a bit. And so, as Dooku launched this attack, Sidious got into contact with a Jedi Temple Guard, one he'd been secretly working with, putting together a contingency plan just in case Dooku lost this battle, and therefore, the war. The Battle of Kamino would be like any other battle in the Clone Wars, quickly earning its place as the most intense and bloody conflict of the entire war. As the heart of the Republic's cloning facilities and home to the clone army, Kamino was a prime target for the Separatists as the overwhelming fleet was launched. The Republic was expecting this for weeks, and so they had a huge fleet of their own waiting for this attack. The battle would unfold on multiple fronts, both in space and on the surface of Kamino itself, as the Separatists would launch pods into the water in order to penetrate the blockade, launching pods into the water, allowing countless battle droids to attack the surface, led by Dooku himself. In the skies above the oceanic planet, the fleets clashed in a spectacle of destruction. Republic and Separatist cruisers were exchanging devastating barrages of turbolaser fire. Starfighters darted through the chaos, engaging in fierce dogfights amidst the debris of the shattered ships. The Republic fighters had the advantage, as the clones were guided by their connection to the Force. The air assault was led by Anakin Skywalker, and he flew with the clones from Separatist cruiser to cruiser, blowing them apart quickly. On the surface, the battle raged with ferocity, led by Kenobi and Ahsoka. Clone troopers, enhanced by the Force, wielding electro staffs alongside their blasters, fought with strength to save their home world. The droids would send their best, using commando droids, droidicas, as many Magna Guards as they could produce to take the clones head on. Electro staffs, blasters, clones, droids, it was a constant battle as the Separatists tried to get into the cloning facilities. And as the battle reached its peak, the fate of Kamino hung in the balance. Every inch of ground was fiercely contested, every skirmish a testament to the bravery, sacrifice of the clones who fought back. But as Dooku looked to the sky to see his Separatist fleet being ripped to shreds, he would take matters into his own hands, moving through the clones, cutting them down one by one without much effort, until finally he reached the clone DNA room. Inside of the room, Dooku was met by Kenobi, Ahsoka, Rex, and Cody. While Anakin and the clone pilots ripped through the space fight, these four were waiting for Dooku. The Sith Lord smiled, saying he's been looking forward to this, igniting his lightsaber. Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, Rex, and Cody quickly would spring into action, their movements working well together, as this was not their first fight together. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka took the offensive on Dooku in a quick display of lightsaber combat, their blades weaving in and out on Dooku, and every time Dooku tried to attack back at them, Rex and Cody were there to intervene. The two clones could not compete with Dooku, but they could still aid the Jedi on defense. But Dooku was a true master of the dark side by this point of the war. His determination to succeed knew no bounds. With a flick of his fingers, he would send waves of force lightning firing at the group, sending them stumbling backwards. But Obi-Wan and Ahsoka rallied back to their feet, and as the battle reached its climax, sparks were flying, lights were flickering as lightsabers clashed into the walls, electro staffs hummed with power. But Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, Rex, and Cody stood tall, drawing upon their strength of their bond and the power of the Force, and with a united effort, they would deflect the lightning back at Dooku, overwhelming him, and with a roar of frustration, Dooku was sent hurtling backwards, crashing into the wall, defeated, but not dead yet. As he stumbled to get back up, Rex and Cody locked eyes, slamming their staffs into the floor, using the force to crush it, the floor where Dooku was laying. The floor cracked, then gave way, and Dooku would fall forever down into the rushing water, where he would quickly die in the unforgiving Kamino Sea. The battle for Kamino was won, as the last of the droids on the surface were wiped out. 
Separatist cruisers crashed into the sea one by one, representing the fall of the Separatists. It was over, and Palpatine would soon learn of this. As soon as Palpatine found out the clones were Force-sensitive, he began extensive planning to use this for his own good. It was quickly very obvious that the war was going to be won by the Republic, and so as the Separatists fell on Kamino, Palpatine watched from his home in the 500 Republica building, as his office in the Executive building was suddenly bombed. He smiled, and within 10 minutes, a temple guard was arrested trying to flee the scene, and this guard purposely dropped a data pad containing forged instructions from the Jedi Council, telling this guard to bomb Palpatine's office. Of course, this guard was secretly working with Palpatine, and this bombing would give Palpatine the perfect opportunity for his next step. Execute Order 66. And the Jedi never stood a chance. Starting on Kamino, as Anakin was finishing up final maneuvers against the Separatists, ten clone fighters lined up behind him, quickly blowing up Anakin's ship, using the Force to guide them. Anakin was a great pilot, but not even he could outmaneuver ten Force-sensitive clones. On the surface, as Kenobi and Ahsoka were aiding with repairs to the facilities, they were quickly surrounded. Ahsoka asked Rex what was going on, as he suddenly used Dooku's saber, stabbing her through the heart. Kenobi moved in to defend himself, but he too would quickly die to the clones. All around the galaxy, clone troopers used the Force to easily outnumber and overpower their Jedi leaders. Plo Koon, Aayla Sakura, Kiedi Mundi, Mace Windu, Yoda, all of the Jedi fell to their clone allies. And inside of the temple, the first three clones to discover this power, Naz, Ant, and Gus, led their clone legion into the temple, cutting down every single Jedi with their Electro Staffs, using the Force to bring down the temple upon itself. Within an hour, the Jedi Order was accused of bombing the Chancellor's office and massacred across the galaxy for treason. Unfortunately for Palpatine, much of the galaxy's citizens still supported the Jedi, so this execution of Order 66 was not taken kindly. But Palpatine didn't care. He had a grand army of Force users at his disposal. He would quickly turn the Republic into the first galactic empire, ensuring safety and security, and he would do this by launching clone armies to every single planet to enforce peace by any means necessary. Clones would use their staffs along with the lightsabers of the fallen Jedi, and they would bring this peace by destroying anyone who defies their new imperial rule. For weeks, the mostly peaceful Republic would shift into an empire ruled by fear under Emperor Palpatine, who was using these clones to do whatever he wanted. It was like a Sith army completely under his own control. But it would not last forever. These clones were stronger than Palpatine anticipated, not only in combat, but mentally as well. The inhibitor chips did initially work exactly as planned, but just weeks after Order 66, clones began to use the Force sifting through these chips, questioning what they did and why they did it. And on Coruscant, Rex, Cody, Nas, Gus, and Ant would gather together to discuss this, and Nas would propose they use a Jedi technique of meditation to find the truth about all of this. Why did they truly attack the Jedi? So these clones would go into a deep meditation, searching within themselves, and they would dig deep within themselves to find the inhibitor chips within their brains. And using the Force, they were able to shut down these chips altogether. And upon doing this, they all would see the truth. Palpatine is the true enemy of the galaxy, not the Jedi. And so over the next few weeks, these five clones would discreetly spread into the galaxy, leading meditation techniques with other clones, getting them to disable their own chips, and with every clone they saved, more of them would spread out, helping others disable their chips. As this continued, the clones were deeply saddened by their actions against the Jedi, and soon they would unite against their unjust, tyrannical emperor. As Palpatine was back in his office one day, ruling over this empire, his Imperial Guards were choked, killed at the door, as Nas, Gus, and Ant entered the room. The three of them would ignite lightsabers that they took from the massacred Jedi Temple. Palpatine would turn in his chair, asking the clones if they truly believed they could defeat him. He rules an entire empire, and a few deserters do not pose any type of threat. But Nas told Palpatine that he rules nothing, and suddenly a fleet of Star Destroyers emerged from space, and a message was sent down to the Senate, informing everyone that Palpatine's rule is coming to a swift end today. No one would have a problem with this. Palpatine ruled with fear and power. Without the clones, he didn't have power over the galaxy, so he ignited a red blade, 
telling these three that they will die today, and he shot a powerful blast of lightning, but the clones were ready. They were born from Dooku's blood, and these were the most powerful of all the clones. Before the lightning could hit them, the clones fired back their own lightning, and it cut through Palpatine's burst, slamming into his chest, ripping it open. The Sith Lord fell to the ground, gasping for air, as Nas walked up to him, saying that he never should have underestimated the clones. Together, they are strong. And today, Palpatine dies alone. The three of them would stab Palpatine, killing him, and the galaxy was freed. To make up for their destruction to the galaxy, and to the Jedi, the clones would stay on their planets no longer as enforcers of an empire, but to help rebuild what has been destroyed, bring aid and peace back to the Republic. This is what the clones were created for, and without war, they collectively decided they will help the galaxy ensure that war never returns again. The clones would go from soldiers to peacekeepers across the galaxy, and Chancellor Ryo Chuchi was more than happy to allow this. The Jedi, the Sith, were dead, but in their place, the Clone Order would rise and begin building their own Force religion to replace the Jedi and keep the peace in the galaxy. Over time, temples would be built on Kamino, and the clones would spread into the galaxy not as soldiers any longer, but as protectors of the people. And folks, that is our story for today. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. I kind of wanted to do, you know, Rex and Cody, obviously we all know those guys, but I wanted to also just create my own created clone, sort of, Nas and Gus, based off, um, I'm a Minnesota Timberwolves fan, and Nas Reed, Anthony Edwards, yeah, figured I'd throw those references in there. Anyways, um, that was fun for me to just kind of create my own sect of clones. Force sensitive, I've, there was a couple ways I could have done this, obviously. No Order 66 was option one, have the clones just ultimately help defeat Palpatine, but I wanted to do more than that, I wanted to ultimately have the clones be the last surviving force religion around, which I haven't seen done before, so I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, let me know what you thought of this video. A lot happened. Um, the idea of the clones not only having the force, but upon finding out they have the force, just being like super strong with it. I thought that was an idea that I could just use to kind of, you know, have it be more fun. Because if they have the force, but they have to go through years of training, like, eh. So, we did a little loophole, just have, you know. They use the force and they're really good with it. Anyways, let me know what you thought. Thanks for watching. Check the pinned comment for the lightsaber giveaway at 60,000. And I'll see you in the next video.